Hi everyone, I'm Tim Ansell and I'll be talking today about the Google Skywater PDK. Uh, but first, a little bit of background about me. I'm a software engineer and I've been a software engineer since uh, about 2000. I'm also an open source engineer. I've been doing uh, open source development uh, since about 1995. Um, and I'm also work at Google. Um, I've done a whole bunch of open source development at Google, and I've been at Google for about 12 years. Uh, the interesting thing about Google is that it runs on computers. Uh, it runs on a lot of computers, uh, but there's a problem. Uh, the problem is that Moore's law is coming to an end. We've seen that single core performance has uh, no longer increased and we've gone towards multi-core, uh, but even that is starting to end. And for a place like Google, demand is not slowing down. We're seeing increasing number of projects being launched. And for things that we have already launched, we are seeing uh, continued exponential-like growth in their usage. Um, for some domains like ML, we have started deploying uh, hardware accelerators to keep up with uh, this demand, and they've been very successful at doing that. However, once you start doing hardware accelerator development, you quickly run into this problem in the EDA world where EDA doesn't seem to have kept up with Moore's law. The actual performance we get out of a node and the theoretical performance we should get from a node uh, seems quite different. And this makes us quite sad that there's all this performance being left on the floor and so my team has been doing uh, research in how to fix that problem. Uh, a little bit about Google's uh, philosophy on research. First and foremost, uh, we believe sharing knowledge accelerates everyone's progress in that area. And for something like EDA, uh, it's a really complicated and big area. And to make research shareable, it also has to be reproducible. And to do that, you really need the complete software environment and full source code available for the thing you're trying to reproduce, as this report from Sodden uh, in 2009 talks about. And to make that possible, you really need unrestricted licenses. As the paper on um, uh, the principles of scientific licensing talks about for, to enable uh, dissemination and sharing and reuse of scientific research, the licensing should be minimized and any additional requirements on top of that should be only added when there's strong and compelling reason and rationale for them. And if you look at the ASIC industry, you'll find that these restrictions are everywhere. You need a restrictive NDA to access data. The tools are closed source and proprietary. Frequently, uh, designs are released with academic usage only, and there are very few uh, resources that are freely available to everyone. And this was highlighted by numerous people in the industry. Um, and the National Academies of Science and Engineering and Medicine explicitly mentions that uh, the way to improve an area um, is to invest in research and development of open source usable tools and infrastructure. And Google has experienced this 
in the machine learning space where through releasing things like TensorFlow, we've seen a massive explosion in the capabilities and research of machine learning. Google has also found that doing things like releasing code and new data sets is something that we are very much uh, able to do in a way that uh, enables a bigger impact. And so uh, this is something we're very interested in doing in other spaces apart from just the ML space. Um, we're also very interested in connecting research and development teams together and eliminating or minimizing that traditional technology transfer process. And um, we've been quite successful in this in the machine learning space. Uh, the time between uh, researchers developing something cool in machine learning and a product being available uh, with that technology in it is uh, quite low now. And we would love to see that in hardware as well. Currently, hardware design, when an academic publishes something interesting, it can be 10 years, uh, or if at all, that technology ends up in a real usable product. And so what we started looking at is what are the roadblocks that are preventing a fully open source ASIC EDA ecosystem. And my group at Google identified that there were four key areas that needed to be improved to um, uh, help enable a fully open source ecosystem. At ICCAD 20, I gave a talk about this and published a paper uh, including a lot more information about all these areas and uh, which parts of, of those four areas we're uh, attempting to address. In this talk, I'm just going to concentrate on the first area, which is this manufacturable PDK. So when you're creating an ASIC, you really need three components. You need the RTL, you need the tools that compile the RTL, and then you need the PDK data. For a long time, we've actually had quite good resources in the RTL and IP library uh, space. And thanks to projects uh, like RISC-V, we've actually seen a massive explosion in fully open source RTL. Um, there's probably thousands now uh, risk five cores out there um, that uh, the RTL is available under a fully open source license. We've also had open source EDA tools for a long time. Um, groups like DARPA have been investing in programs like IDEA and POSH, which has created the Open Road project, uh, which is a very interesting EDA tool flow. There is the Alliance and Coriolis flows out of Europe, and the older Q router and Q flow uh, based approaches that have been used to tape out ASICs before. But the PDK data has been a real sticking point. And when you look at what is inside a PDK, it's all the very low level details of what it takes to create your actual resulting chip. And that has a big effect on how the chip works and what type of performance you can get out of the chip. Uh, if you look at the kind of existing ecosystem uh, for PDKs that you can get that are freely available. Um, you can get maybe some for some older nodes, but anything more advanced is under things like non-commercial licenses or 
are not real PDKs that uh, can be manufactured. And this is really uh, important because if you're a company like, say, eFabulous that wants to do a fully uh, open source chip, you can have a case where your uh, TL is fully open source, uh, the tooling you're using is fully open source, and then if you use a closed source PDK, like in the Ravina case, where it was the XFAB 180 nanometer PDK, um, this PDK data effectively infects your whole ASIC, meaning that you can't release a version of your result that anybody else can tape out and get exactly the same result as uh, you did. You can't publish the GDS. You can't really provide um, information about what your design really does because this PDK data is so fundamental to how the chip functions. And this blocks a lot of interesting research. The slack of PDK that is actually manufacturable that you can use to create real chips and evaluate real chips uh, means that this ASIC industry is very, very closed. And so this was the number one roadblock that uh, we identified. And so we wanted to remove it. And so I'm happy to introduce a new project that we launched, I think about six months ago now, um, as part of uh, the Fossey Foundation Dial-Up Talk Series is the first time I announced it. And it's a partnership between Google and Skywater. This is a fully open source, 130 nanometer node PDK that you can actually manufacture. It's hosted on GitHub. It's under an open source license. It's under Apache 2 license. Uh, you can go to GitHub. You don't need to sign an NDA. You don't need to do anything. Uh, there's nothing to sign. You just clone it, just like you would any other piece of software. Um, and that's pretty cool. And so what do you get for uh, the Sky 130 uh, process node, which is what the Skywater PDK, the Google Skywater PDK is targeting. Um, it's a 1.8 volt internal with five volt compatible IOs. Um, it has one level of local interconnect and five levels of, mail, uh, of metal. It's inductor capable. It has MIM capacitors. It includes Sonos shrunken cells. It supports a 10 volt regulated supply. It has high voltage extended drain NMOS and PMOS FETs. And it's a 130 nanometer node. This is a 20 year old technology, but still makes up a significantly large part of uh, the chips that are done today. This is what the stack up looks like. Um, you can, can see uh, the metal stack, and uh, you can see it's a 130 nanometer node with things like MIM caps. The interesting thing is all this documentation around how you use this process node is published on Read the Docs using Sphinx, just like any software project out there. Um, and this is public available. Anybody can go and view this without having to sign anything and without having to agree to anything. Just again, like every piece of software that um, is in the open source world. Uh, this is one of the pages um, from an earlier release of the documentation. Uh, here you can see um, some examples of the design rules and uh, some diagrams describing design rules that you need uh, to satisfy to be manufacturable on this process. And there's tons more documentation there 
and it continues to improve rapidly. And so with this fully open source 130 nanometer production PDK, we have now the ability to make a fully open source ASIC. And this is really exciting to me. Uh, the 130 nanometers means it's probably not going to be, you know, a data center class Intel CPU. It's probably going to be more in the IoT space. Um, but the PDK includes a whole bunch of digital standard cells. It includes IO and periphery cells. It includes base primitives and automated DRC rules that are compatible with uh, open source tools. It includes analog RF primitives, which is very good for the IoT uh, type place. It includes an optimized SRAM build space. Um, and it will include a flash build space, but that's not quite uh, there yet. Uh, maybe by the time you're watching this, uh, it will be. Um, Doing this release was a quite a large amount of work that required us working with a lot of different partners, uh, both commercial partners and um, academic partners to prove that these uh, data work with various tools out there. And if you're interested, you can join the announcement nailing list where we send out information about how things are going. And there's also a very active Slack channel, which has about a thousand engineers actively talking about using the Skywater PDK to do interesting things. And what we want to see is a growing ecosystem of fully open source IP that is reusable and people can improve on. And to grow this ecosystem, we also announced a open source shuttle program. And this basically means uh, Google is footing the bill for you to do test chips with, uh, through eFabulous, who's managing all the actual program. Um, the first run is happening in November. So by the time you've seen this, it's probably already gone off. Uh, there'll be a second run uh, early 2021 and multiple more runs in 2021. The goal is to have a minimum of six runs in total. And each run is open to anyone who has designs that are fully open source. And when we say fully open source, we mean open source all the way down to the GDS. Because the PDK data is now available, that is 100% possible. And anyone means academics, it means makers, it means hobbyists, it means commercial companies, big, small startups, anyone who is willing for their design to be released as open source, uh, publicly to anyone um, can apply to get on the shuttle. Each shuttle run has roughly 40 slots. And the way you submit is you go to the eFabulous platform and you provide a URL to your GitHub or Git project, which contains your results. And this is not your average shuttle. What we're aiming for is to make your prototypes uh, not precious. You should be able to share them. You should be able to try and fail and try again. You'll get roughly 10 millimeters uh, squared, and there'll be a standardized harness with RISC-V power and RAM, which lets you uh, analyze what went wrong if your design isn't working out of the box. As I said, we're trying to get back to you around 100 chips um, so that your parts are not precious. Again, you should join the mailing list and the Slack workspace to get more information as things evolve. 
So how do you do this? Well, the digital design is pretty easy. There's a wide variety of digital standard cells in the PDK that are compatible with multiple different tools. Uh, they have symbols and schematics and they have the GDS and you can use the Open Road project, uh, which was funded by DARPA and led by Andrew and has many contributors to actually do digital place and route for this. Um, Open Road is really cool in that you can use Open Road and the open source PDK to effectively do a fully open source reproducible end to end creation of an ASIC. Um, there's some parts of the design where you need special tools, though. Um, so what special tools should be using? Well, for a memory generator, as I said, we have optimized SRAM bit cells, including single port, dual port. Uh, and if you compare them to a D flip flop, you can see they're significantly smaller. And these are the actual GDS layouts for Sky 130. Um, we also hope to improve them even more. But these cells by themselves aren't particularly useful. You need to compile them into a design. And so we've been working with the Open RAM group to have a fully open source memory compiler that is able to target the Sky 130 using the optimized build space. And Matt Goodhouse, who leads that project, gave a talk again as part of the FOSSI dial-up series um, on Open RAM. Uh, to prove that you can do even more interesting things, um, you can even design uh, your own standard cells. And uh, James Stein at the Oklahoma State University has actually done this. And he has a long history of designing standard cells. And so he created the Sky 130 OSU cell set, which is a, another set of standard cells. And here you can see, again, the GDS for these standard cells. This is actually what these cells look like. There's no fakeness here. And this uh, output, uh, these standard cells, um, I have been fully characterized and uh, work with both, again, closed and open source tools. And they have demonstrated uh, taping out um, uh, ARM v4 core, with, uh, which gets about 370 megahertz. Um, and James Stein gave a talk as part of the FOSSI dial-up uh, series about these standard cells. Um, you also need to be able to do DRC and LVS checks. And for that, uh, Magic is currently supported. And Tim Edwards, who's the current developer of Magic, uh, gave a talk about this only recently. Um, and uh, that's all pretty cool. Um, we'd love to see K layout support. And I know a bunch of people are working on them. And uh, we've actually done a bunch of work to do examples with this PDK. Um, so eFabulous, um, who we've partnered with to do most of the actual work, um, has a line of chips they're calling Strive uh, that has been testing various different IP. Um, the Strive SOC that they've done is uh, a Pico RV32 RISC-V and a little SRAM, and they place and routed it with the open road flow, and this is what it looks like. Uh, this version was done uh, before the memory compiler was available, so it uses uh, D flip-flops for memory, so it's not very area efficient. Um, then there's the Strive 2 design, uh, which starts adding in uh, the open RAM uh, generated memory. And there are more and more uh, Strive test ships being done. And these are fully open source. The RTL is open source. The tools used to them make them are open source. It's based on the PDK that's open source. 
so they can publish the full design down to the GDS. You can take their identical GDS and get a chip that works identical to their part. Um, you could technically even take it to a different foundry that had the same uh, design rules as Skywater and tape it out there. And in theory, you should get exactly the same result there. And I think this opens up a lot of more interesting things that we can uh, explore in this space. Um, we're already seeing that there's plenty of areas for optimizing this PDK that even though it's a 20 year old PDK, haven't been done yet. Uh, we can see ways to shave even more off those SRAM uh, cells. We can see more ways to optimize the standard cells and we can iterate on this. Um, so I'm very excited to see what people do with this open source PDK. And if this is successful, uh, we are very incentivized to release more and more advanced technologies. Um, so if you're interested in seeing, say, a 90 nanometer PDK or a 45 nanometer PDK that is real and manufacturable, uh, come and help show that there is real innovation still left at 130 nanometers and that there's real interesting designs you can do that you're never able to do before because uh, you didn't have access to this technology or because um, you just didn't have the will to go and sign yet another NDA. And so that is what the Google Skywater PDK is and uh, what we're trying to do. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this is a pretty short talk. Uh, there's a lot more information in this area. Um, there's a whole talk series on the individual parts of it as part of the Fossey Foundation dial-up talk series. Um, there's a whole bunch of papers at ICCAD about this. Um, I was only one of about 20 papers related to the Skywater project uh, that was published um, at ICCAD and especially at the WhatsApp uh, talk, um, like WhatsApp special session. So um, I'm excited to see what people are doing and what people use these shuttles for. And I am extremely excited to see people do things that have never been done before that have previously been dismissed as impossible or not making sense um, because, uh, there's very low risk in doing this. The worst thing you're going to end up with is a bunch of little paperweights that you can't really do anything with. It's not gonna cost you anything apart from your time. Um, so I'm, again, encourage everybody to get involved. Uh, the Slack space is very, very active. Um, there are a lot of people doing a lot of interesting things. Um, so please do uh, do cool stuff.